Something could happen on this show, you never can tell. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Rock and Roll Show with Pam and Joe. I'm Pam, and I am the director of the Dick Biondi documentary that's been in progress for about six and a half years now. And thanks to all of our wonderful supporters out there, we're getting there. The story is, is coming. So thank you to everybody. And I'm here with my director of communications and marketing for the Dick Biondi film, and he's also my co-host for this show. Welcome to Joe Farina. Hi, Joe. Hi, Pam. Thank you so much for that awesome introduction. And yes, we want to thank everybody out there for their support uh, for the Dick Biondi film. To learn more, uh, go to dickbiondifilm.com. Make sure uh, to like our Facebook page and also join our Facebook group. And we also have a fantastic Dick Biondi film YouTube channel. So be sure to check that out and uh, uh, subscribe to that. It's a lot of fun, a lot of great stuff on there. Thank you, Joe. You got it. Uh, it is our pleasure uh, to intru introduce to you our special guest for tonight, a fantastic singer, a songwriter, and musician. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the Rock and Roll Show with Pam and Joe, the fantastic Brian Highland. Brian, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Joe. Nice to be here. Hi, Brian. What a pleasure. Hi, Pam. Nice, you know, nice before be we here. get started, I got to tell you something. Back in the summer of 62, I believe it was, I was, I went to Oak Park to, uh, it was called the Oak Park Arms. I think it was a hotel, but they had an outdoor concert and you were there with Dick Biondi and I was wow. there with my girlfriend. And my girlfriend wow. had a mad crush on you. And <laughs> of course, we got to meet you because I know Dick and Dick introduced us to you. And she took a picture of Dick and me, which I still have to this day. And I took a picture of you and her, which didn't turn out. And she's still <laughs> mad at me. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? I mean, really. Well, that's, that's the way it goes, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, had I ever dreamed that I'd be talking to you on uh, this show uh, way back then, I mean, I never would have dreamed it. It's great. So thank you for joining us. This is really exciting. It's my, my pleasure. Thank you. Um, Brian, um, first set of questions that we'd like to uh, ask you is, um, who were your biggest influences and how did you get into music? My biggest influences were, uh, uh, I guess, because my, I had a brother, my, my brother Keith, and uh, we used to uh, sing, and we really got into it when we heard the Everly Brothers. So that was one of the real big influences on, on, on singing, you know, just learning songs and all. And the other people, I guess, at that time that, that I really listened to on the radio, in my little uh, radio in my house, were like Buddy Holly, uh, I guess um, Elvis, of course, Carl Perkins, uh, and also in uh, being that I'm from New York, I'm, I lived in Queens, and uh, Frankie Lyman and the Teenagers, they were, that was oh. like, when when they hit it, it was like, I, I thought, wow, that he's just as old as I am, and, you know, it was like an incentive to, uh, you know, you know, that was like a big incentive to maybe make a record or, you know, be in the music business. And um, there were other people like, you know, over the years uh, that have uh, like were influences, like, for instance, uh, Lee Dorsey. And um, I like I liked his records. Fats Domino, The Platters, The Flamingos. Mm -hmm. uh, the students were really I thought they were great. They only made a couple of records, but uh, they were really good. And, uh, you know, there's a I guess there was a lot of things in the air at that time, just different mm -hmm. songs and everything. Fantastic. And I mean, your big hit, uh, number one in America, number one in Australia, I read, number one all over the place, Itsy Bitsy Teeny Weeny Yellow Polka Dot Bikini. Right. Yeah. You were only 16 <laughs> years old. Is that right? When you, when, when you yeah. had your first hit? Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, I, was, I, was, I was 16 and uh, 
that was, uh, you know, I was actually 16 and a half, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's how we all used to be, right, back in those days. Yeah. You know? We added that half on. But uh, anyway, so that was, uh, yeah, I had uh, the year before, in, in 1959, that would have been, uh, I started with a friend of mine going around to record companies. Uh, and we had a demo record and I had a, actually we had a doo-wop group and I, I sang the lead on one of the songs that we had on, we had a couple of demos, uh, uh, two-sided demo, I guess. And uh, anyway, we brought it up to Sammy Cave's office. Someone told us they're looking for singers up there. And uh, so brought it up there and uh, they listened to, they listened to it. And then they said, well, you know, we're not looking for groups but we like the way that you sing, Brian. So would you be interested in just being a solo artist? So I, I said, well, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. And uh, I told the guys wow. in the group and uh, you know, like in that instant, I became a solo artist and uh, the guys were, they were fine with it. You know, they didn't, uh, they didn't care. So um, from that point on, I started going over there, uh, like a, at a certain point I became the office boy at Sammy K's office. And this was going on for maybe about uh, six months or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I'm, and then I cut some, I was working with their arranger there named Bugs Bauer. And he was a, he wrote music books and he, he was a fantastic person and helped me quite a lot. Anyway, so uh, uh, I cut a few demos and uh, one of the demos was a song called Rosemary. And Rosemary, was sent around all over the country to get other people to sing it. So I was like the demo singer basically on that. Mm -hmm. And so they got two hits on it actually. Uh, one, a guy named Larry Hall, who had the song Sandy, which was a hit the, the year before. And another person uh, who was a songwriter actually, Barry Divorjan. And I think he had a group, Barry and the Tamerlanes, that was another. And he, he wrote a lot of good songs. I mean, over the sixties, he wrote, a little one for uh, Dorsey Burnett, and uh, but anyway, yeah, uh, they recorded the song also, and I they took it up to Cap Records that demo to sell the song, and Cap Records said, well, uh, we like this song, but who's the guy on the demo? And they said, well, it's our office boy Brian Island. <laughs> so they said, uh, yeah, okay, so we'd like to record him and do a master session with that song, Rosemary. So. And we did that and it came out and I found out later it actually sold about 22,000 copies. So wow. then I said, okay, let's do another session. And we had a song kind of uh, going ready to go. And then at the last minute, the, uh, I got a phone call and they said, Brian, come over here. We found this song for you. It's called Itsy Bitsy Teeny Weeny Yellow Polka Dot Bikini. And that's how that happened. And I went over about a week later, recorded it and, um, and it, it took off. And what did you think when you first heard it? I mean, that's quite an unusual title and, a, and an unusual oh, yeah. song, really. It, uh, it was, well, it's a novelty song, but, you know, in, in such a way that uh, when I first heard it, it was a demo record. And the demo was, <clears throat> excuse me, three girls singing it. Mm. And uh, <clears throat> I thought, where do I, where am I going to sing on this, uh, in this song? And they said, okay, you're going to, They'll do this part, you do this part, and then there'll be a spoken part too. And then, you know, so then I, okay, that's cool. And uh, so we, we went in and did it. In those days, when you did a session like that, everybody was in this session at the same, in the studio at the same time. And uh, so it was, uh, it was exciting, you know, to, uh, oh, in that situation. So that was, uh, and so we did the session and mixed it right then. You know, I mean, it was a very quick process. And uh, came out probably about a week later, and uh, it got on the radio almost instantly. So, yeah. well, you know, just to have such a, a number one record at your first record, basically. I mean, okay, yeah, you did have the other record, but you know what I'm saying? That was so yeah early. Right. How did that affect right. you? Um, you know, was it like, did it go to your head or did you, you know? No, 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 of course not. <laughs> <laughs> no, but my, 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 my mom and my, and my brothers, I have six brothers and one sister. We all lived in a house in Woodhaven in Queens. And um, so, you know, the phone was ringing quite a lot from, you know, because our number was in the, in the phone book. So we were getting all these phone calls from girls that were, you know, from I'll actually bet. from my from my neighborhood <laughs> mostly, 
<laughs> and uh, so, uh, you know, that and then people would just show up and knock on the door, you know, and they'd say, oh, we have your autograph. And, uh, and But there, everybody was pretty nice. They're pretty nice about it. And, um, but, right. you know, being that I was in from a family, such a big family, so that wasn't anything like going to my head or anything like that. That wasn't, that wasn't going to happen. That's great. Yeah. Cause you did seem like a very sweet young man, really. I mean, you didn't seem like it went to your head, but uh, I had asked. Well, no, you know, I, I, I appreciated, you know, the actually, I appreciate because of, you know, being, getting a taste of the, of the music industry by being the office boy there. And it was in the Brill building also. So that, uh, you know, I got a feel for the different songwriters and the whole thing, like behind the scenes aspect of it. It's yeah. a great uh, experience. It, 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 it is. And it seems like, you know, there's such great history uh, behind uh, songs like Itsy Bitsy. And you also, I remember Dick Biondi playing. I used to listen to Dick Biondi all the time on WJMK here uh, in the Chicago area. Yeah. And I remember, I remember him playing uh, your songs, not only Itsy Bitsy, but also uh, Sealed with a Kiss and Gypsy mm -hmm. Woman. And I was wondering if you could tell yeah. us a little bit of history behind uh, those songs as well. Well, I, I have a really funny story, actually, about uh, Sealed with a Kiss. This is, uh, and Dick knows this story because he, uh, he was involved in it. The, uh, I, I did a session in New York, and, uh, and like the next day, I flew to Chicago to, to meet with the tour that was just starting from Chicago with Del Fannin and the Belmonts. And, mm -hmm. the, and the band was from uh, Detroit, a band, Jimmy Coe's band. And they backed the tour. And so we, uh, you know, I got to the hotel and, but the day before I had been at the session and where they were mixing Seal with a Kiss. And uh, so uh, I was there, you know, and so after they, had finished the whole thing. They cut an acetate and they gave it to me and they said, you're going to Chicago, see if you can get, play this uh, or, you know, give it to Dick Biondi. And it was just <laughs> an acetate of, you know, a 45, which they cut right at the, at the studio. So wow. um, I took that, uh, got, you know, got, got to the hotel, checked in, took a cab down to uh, WLS and uh, down there, I don't know exactly. It was on Lakeshore Drive, I think. Or maybe. Yes, it was. Anyway, so Michigan so Avenue. I, and Michigan which, Avenue. Oh, yeah. actually, Michigan and uh, Wacker. Yep. That's right. Yeah. So anyway, I took it there. I got I got out of the cab and I went in and I said, I'm, I'm going to like to go up. And it was late at night. And they said, Oh no, you can't go up there. <laughs> you can't go to you know the elevators are closed. You know for you know, and that was the, so I said, Well, uh, can you take it up and give it to Dick Biani? So the elevator operator took it up and gave it to Dick Biondi. And he was the actual first, actual first person for sure that ever heard that, you know, as oh. a, a disc jockey and played it and he wow. liked it. Awesome. Yeah. That's, that's great. What that's a great amazing. story. I mean, I, you took us there. I was right there with you. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Yeah. But anyway, but like you asked about uh, Gypsy Woman, about that song. And uh, that, that was like, you know, later on, and that was in 1970 that came out. And uh, right before that, I had been working with Del Shannon, uh, writing songs. And we wrote a song right before, uh, right before Gypsy Woman. It was called Could You Dig It? And it's actually a pretty good record and um, didn't get, uh, it didn't get much action, but I, I always thought it was, uh, uh, there was a guy in, in China that recorded it like the last year and did a really nice version of that song. Mm. And um, anyway, so we we did that one and we got a deal with that with uh, Uni Records, which is uh, Universal, you know, Universal Records. And um, so uh, then we were coming, you know, it's the same thing. We're looking, you know, think we're gonna, we had a couple of other songs that we had written and we thought, oh, this is a really good song. And, um, and then it, right at the last minute before we, we, you know, we decided this is, you know, locked it in kind of, we said, uh, well, if those songs don't come out, our songs, maybe we should have an ace in the hole and like do an oldie. Uh, it wasn't really an oldie at the time, but it was only like, I guess about nine years before in the 61 when the original Gypsy Woman come out. So we, we had a guitar, two guitars and we were playing songs and all of a sudden we said, uh, that song was kind of bubbled up and played and Gypsy Woman we said, yeah. 
we're going to do Gypsy Woman. That's going to be the one. And we did it on the session, and it was like there was no question. That was the uh, came out the best. So and it, that's something. that was another you one. You didn't it, even it rehearse it. it. Unbelievable. Amazing. You know, and, and Brian, right. if I may, if, if I may uh, tell you this, um, because you worked with Del Del Shannon, and uh, kind of a quick trivia bit here. Uh, my 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 late father uh, uh, was Dennis Farina, who was a, a very successful actor. And in the 1980s, he had a, a TV show. He started in a TV show called Crime Story. And oh, I, uh, I saw that. Yeah, I watched that a number of times. Yeah, wow! Wow! Awesome! Thank you. And and oddly enough, uh, Del Shannon uh, re-recorded uh, "Runaway." That was the theme song for uh, for my father's show. So, wow. you, you know, you bringing up Del Shannon, you know, that instant connection to, to, to my father's show. And, and yeah. I wanted to ask you real quickly is, is right. what was it, yeah. what was it like, uh, what was it like working uh, with uh, such a talent like uh, Del Shannon? Well, I met him in 1961 when he had uh, a hats off to Larry. And that was the first time I met him. We were, and it was actually, I think in maybe in uh, Illinois or Indiana somewhere. And uh, it was a record hop that we did. And I was with Kimi Euro, and we were like traveling around with the promotion pen from the record company. And so that was one of the record hops that we, and it was kind of a free deal. You know, this went in and did a record hop and then hopefully they're gonna play your record or, you know, that was kind of unspoken kind of thing that, you know, but that was, you know, that was the way it was. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so on that particular show, they had a regular show after our thing, me and Timmy, and uh, which was Del Shannon and uh, and Bobby Lewis, Bobby Lewis, you know, Tossman and Turner. They were on a tour, mm -hmm. and they came in, and uh, that's when I met Del. So that was the first time, and um, so I knew him all, all that time. And then in '60, on that tour, right when I was saying before about uh, with Seal with a Kiss, I met that tour, and Del was on that tour with uh, the Belmonts. Yeah. Nice. So, and then over the years, I, I kept in contact with him. And when he would record in New York, because uh, he did a lot of his early sessions there, they, he would, when he got into town, he'd call me up. He said, hey, Brian, come on over. We're going to, I'm cutting some records. So the first time I went over, he cut Little Town Flirt. And, mm. uh, and that was, I thought, when I, I was right there when I did it. I was like in, uh, in they did it at Bell Sound Studios. And I watched the whole thing, and it was, uh, you could tell when he, when he did that song, as soon as they got into it, it's going to be a hit. You can just tell. Mm. It, it, was, it was a big hit. Yeah. And a couple of other times he came in uh, when he did Keep Searching. I, I went to that session, and he would have different people would come around, you know, like Wendell. He had a lot of friends there in New York. And uh, like Ernie Moresco, who's also a songwriter, wrote songs with Dion. And uh, I think he wrote The Wanderer with Dion. And uh, he also had a career also in music. And uh, and so uh, it was uh, Del Sessions were really, you know, cool cool to go to. Yeah, it was yeah. a lot of fun. That's awesome. Of That's all awesome. the people that you've worked with over the years, um, you traveled with Dick Clark's Cavalcade of Stars, right? I mean, you must right. have some really great stories about traveling. And you've traveled the world too, right? You've been all over. Yes, I have. Yes. Uh, well, I was lucky, you know, I don't know, because of the record labels, I was, I was on like ABC Paramount, for instance, uh, with Seal with a Kiss. And I had another one right before that called Ginny Come Lately. And Ginny Come Lately was a really big hit over in Europe, in, uh, in England, and uh, over in Holland and Germany. It was a big hit. Mm -hmm. And so then when that Seal with a Kiss came out, it was like the follow up to Ginny Come Lately over there. And so I had like two in a row, really, you know, good, good records. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> excuse me, but I've recently, like, uh, in the, like, since, um, I guess the, in the nineties, late, uh, or the late eighties, I started doing a lot of, uh, co uh, concerts and shows over in Southeast Asia, where I played in, um, uh, in Malaysia, in Singapore, in Bangkok, you know, in Thailand, and uh, I played once down in Jakarta, also in Indonesia. Interesting. And, uh, so it, and my records, you know, you, you'd be surprised how rock and roll, I mean, everywhere. It's like, it's unbelievable how popular <laughs> rock and roll, American rock and roll music. Oh, 
Oh, unreal. And it's always been, it's been, you know, very successful. And, and what kind of differences or similarities have you noticed between uh, the audience uh, here in the States and the audience, uh, audiences overseas? Well, for instance, uh, like in the UK, over in England and, you know, uh, Scotland, Wales, Ireland, the people listen to your, uh, they listen a lot more, you know, I mean, in those days, they would really, uh, you know, you know, and they had pretty good sound systems. It wasn't, you know, like it is today, but so they would, uh, they would, and they, and also the, uh, the English, the music press in England was uh, very, uh, they asked a lot of questions that they never asked over here, uh, you know, because the, the, uh, the magazines and the music press here at, the, at that time was like 16 magazine, Tiger Beat, you know, and all other things like that which were kind of, in a way, kind of superficial. They were asking, you know, what magazines. Kind of, I used to read them. <laughs> right. No, but, you know, they were, that's what it was. And yeah. so you had to do the interviews with them. And, you know, and that was fine. But in England, uh, the, uh, they would know the B-side of your record. Who wrote this? Where you recorded mm -hmm. at? Who, was, who played on the session? They, everything. And they knew wow. all, that, all that information. And, you know, and they would ask you uh, different things like that. Yeah, that's great. So that was that was how it was there. Other places, the uh, you know how you how you were received in Southeast Asia, uh, like in uh, I never really went over there until like the late eighties because there weren't there weren't really any venues there at the time when those records were out mm -hmm. originally. So um, you know eventually now now you know play over there and there's all kinds of places. It's great. Did you ever go to Australia? No, I never. I've never been to Australia. Oh, okay, just but, wondered because I know your no, record I, I, was. I'd love to go. Yeah, I know you said that. I I'd yeah. like to go there, and um, you know, maybe someday I'll go. Yeah, that's. I'm a, I'm from Australia. Well, my mother was from Australia, and I lived there for five years when I was a kid. So. Well, how did you how did you like Australia? I loved it. Uh, living there, yeah. Oh, did yeah, you live in one it. of the big cities or? Uh, yeah, I was in a suburb of Melbourne. Melbourne, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's, That's where my great. mom grew up. So, yeah. And I've been back many times. So my brother lives there, actually, up in Queensland. Wow. So, yeah. I, I always, I look at pictures of, of Australia and, uh, you know, it's kind of like a dream to go there someday. It is. The One beaches. Of the oh, nice. Yeah. Gorgeous. Well, I guess, yeah, the beaches are nice up on the north, right? In the north part. The, uh, the, uh, what's going to say? The, uh, I lost my train of thought. The uh, well, no, I was going to say that one of the nice things about it is everybody speaks English. Yes, <laughs> so that that makes a big difference. But, you know. Although I must say, when I first met my uncle, and he was an old style uh, Aussie who used a lot of slang, I literally could not understand what he was saying. It was so wow. funny. <laughs> wow. They really have some heavy slang, but not so much these days. But the old timers. You, you couldn't yeah. understand what they were saying. <laughs> so, oh my wow. gosh. Yeah. But um, anyway, um, so you don't have any like special stories about like traveling on the road with somebody and some crazy thing happened or? Well, uh, for instance, uh, like Gene Pitney, uh, he, I, I did a lot of shows with Gene Pitney on those Dick Clark caravans. And uh, I can remember one time that uh, they had a contest, a date, win a date with because I would room, we were roommates on those tours because we would save money that way because Dick Clark on the caravans, not that he was cheap or anything, but they would book the rooms, but then we had to pay. Oh, <laughs> we boy. Had to pay the hotels. So with Gene, we got, uh, you know, we were like roommates. So uh, I, this one time, uh, some, uh, they had a contest in, in one of the towns we played, win a date with Gene Pitney. So... Uh, <laughs> So the girl, a girl won the contest and she was nine years old. <laughs> so, oh, so she, she got him on the phone, you know, they, well, I guess she was at the radio station or, you know, so the, the first question, <laughs> she asked him if he liked to climb trees. <laughs> he, oh, he, didn't know, he, didn't, he didn't know how to take that, you know, oh. but that was, I thought that was great. You know, That's great adorable. Great. Gosh, that is, that is. And, and, <laughs> And, and, and Brian, just uh, you're looking at your history and your background and, and what you're doing now. I mean, we think it's so great that you're um, 
still out there performing, yeah. um, you know, reaching out to uh, current fans of your m- music, but also newer generations uh, that would become fans of, uh, of, your, uh, of your music. And once the pandemic ends, hopefully sometime in 2021, um, what are your future plans? Do you uh, want to go out there, continue uh, touring? Uh, I know we mentioned Australia, maybe Australia in 2021. Yeah. What are some yeah, of your plans, know. hopefully, in 2021 or once the pandemic ends? Well, you know, really, I want to get my life back. <laughs> I mean, my, on the road, that was, that was uh, what I do. And my son, Bodhi, he's my drummer. Yeah. And so we, we do shows all over the place. And uh, we were in, before it started, we were on a cruise uh, in February with a whole bunch of different, Freddie Cannon, with Johnny Tillotson, with the Stephans, uh with, uh, you know, just a whole bunch of different people, Johnny, uh, Johnny Contardo, Bowser. Uh, and Rocky and the Rollers were the backup band. It was a nice cruise. And when the cruise ended, the thing started, you know, with the pandemic started. Yeah. And it was like yeah. two days or a week later, and then everything got shut down. So I'm hoping that, uh, you know, this is going to end pretty soon and we can get back doing shows. And uh, I'm also, I, uh, I have a studio at my house here. And uh, so I, I'm, I'm constantly you know, doing different uh putting out new new material and i've put them up on uh, apple music and uh and spotify some of the songs are up on there and mm. uh, all of them actually new new things that i've done and right now i got i'm working on a project with lala from the crystals and oh, we're yeah, working on something books, that sure. we're going to do uh like a duet on a song and i won't tell you about it, but when it i'm uh i can get you a copy of it or you know send it you know and That'd check be it out. Great. We would I love it. Like Thank it. you. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and let us know. We'll put, uh, you know, post it on our p- Facebook page when you get it out. Absolutely. We can't yeah. wait to hear that. And and you uh, just a few moments ago, you mentioned uh, your son Bodie. What what is it like to have um, right. your son Bodie involved uh, in uh, your music? It seems like well, you're very pro- very proud and all that. Yeah. Yes, oh, I am. And uh, I I just on a sad note, my my wife passed away in 2018. And so Bodhi is like the two of us now. It's just the two of us. Mm. And um, so we're, uh, you know, we're hanging together. And, uh, uh. Uh, you know, and he, he's helping me quite a lot. And uh, he's a very, very resourceful person, very smart. And uh, so we do a lot of, you know, like, he does a lot of the stuff like, uh, for instance, uh, talking to the agents and, and all that yeah. and talking to the bands before we get to the gigs. And um, so, oh, you know, he me. Plus, he, plus he's a great drummer, you know, and uh, that, that makes uh, all the difference in the world. Sounds like a perfect That's compliment wonderful. to you. Yeah, it very, is. It's yeah. great. Yeah. Very, yeah. very sorry um, that you're, you know, about your, about your wife passing away a couple of years ago. Thank and, you. Uh, and it, but it sounds like Bodie, uh, Bodie and you have a special connection and uh, you guys just seem to, to click and connect and, uh, you seem like a very, very, very proud, uh, proud father. I am. I am very proud. Yeah. That's great. That's awesome. That's great. So um, we haven't talked about Dick Biondi now, um, other than the fact that I met you that day in uh, 1962. <laughs> um, right. Do you have a, a special story about Dick or how did you well, meet Dick? Well, I guess, you know, over the years, uh, I just wanted to say that, um, uh, Dick Biondi was one of a group of, of, of uh, disc jockeys in the United States at that time that were on very powerful stations. And there was one, there was a station in Buffalo, WKBW. There was a station in the West Coast, uh, you know, KKHJ, I think it was, and uh, in uh, Oklahoma City. And then Wolfman was down there and, you know, broadcast out of Mexico. And you had these stations. There was another one, Wheeling, West Virginia. They played country and bluegrass music, but they had strong signals on those stations. And mm-hmm. Dick Biondi was on, and his voice got all over the Midwest. And all over the country, time, actually. All over the country, right. And yeah. everyone knew Dick, every time you talk about disc jockeys in the Midwest, and his name would come up, you know, and, and mm-hmm. it was, he was the guy. And uh, I, I've only met him a few times, and every time I met him, I thought, what a 
nice person and a humble person mm-hmm. uh, who was very powerful in a sense mm-hmm. because, uh, you know, he was uh, playing your records, but he was also a nice person. And I always liked talking to him. Yeah, you, you nailed it. He was just a great guy. He was always trying to promote artists. He loved rock and roll and he loved, he had great respect for the artist and the yeah. music and um, yeah, and dedicated his life to it. And yet he was just so nice. He just would do anything right. for you. He was just himself. And that was, that was the yeah. beauty of it. Yeah. And you know, he's from New York. He's Is that what, originally, I, I didn't know that. No. yeah, originally oh. from upper state New York, a little town called Endicott. Endicott. Oh, I, yeah. I, I think I've passed through there, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. that's great. And it sounds like uh, from your experience, Brian, that uh, DJs like, Dick Biondi, and you mentioned a couple others, had a, a very important role um, in the success of, uh, of a song. And just from your perspective, can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Well, you know, the one person I did leave out was Dick Clark. Everybody, you know, Dick Clark, he, he was on television every day. And uh, Dick Clark really, uh, in, my, in my particular case, he, because uh, like after Polka Dot Bikini, after that record was such a big hit, then uh, I got another deal like a year later uh, working with producers, uh, Gary Geld and P.D. Udell, who uh, uh, wrote, they wrote Seal With A Kiss, Jeannie Kamehameha, but they, they liked the way that I sang and they said, Brian, we'd like to do uh, a song with you and we want to do a production, an independent production. And, uh, which, and the first song that we did was Let Me Belong To You. It was a so, really slow ballad a beautiful song, great chord progression. And so we recorded that and uh, we got a deal with ABC Paramount Records. And so Dick Clark liked it. And so he started playing it on American Bandstand and that really helped me quite a lot, you know, because mm-hmm. he, he really liked that record. And uh, he, so Dick Clark was amongst that group of, of disc jockeys only he was on TV. And, uh, but, you know, there were, uh, it, that was an important thing uh, uh, for the country and everything, I guess, you know, to, to have that kind of, uh, of, of situation where they would play the new records that came out and, mm-hmm. you know, and if they, if they really started playing it like every night, that would, that would be a big deal. That's yeah. right. You got sure. it. And, you know, Dick being on WLS after night, you know, at night, night, uh, it opened up the signal all across the country. So he broke a lot of records nationwide because of it. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. yeah, he was Dick Dick Biondi, and um, you know I can't say enough about him because he was a uh, he helped me quite a lot. And uh, you know other but there was a couple of records that that were big hits in Chicago for me. Mm. I had this one song called "I'm Afraid to Go Home," which is about the Civil War, <clears throat> and it, it was got it got a lot of action in Chicago in that area because they they played it on the on the stations there. And uh, wherever I go, people want to hear that song. And it's uh, one of my favorite, uh, you know, I'm proud of that record. Oh, so right. it was a, a good one. That's, yeah. That's yeah. awesome. That's awesome. So where can people uh, learn more about you, Brian? Well, I'm on Facebook. And um, I have a, also brianhyland.com, which is, you know, <laughs> Makes was sense. Pretty easy to, yeah, <laughs> it was pretty easy to get. And uh because I got it a long time ago, you know, when, when it was easier. Nowadays, people get those and they, you know, they, they, they hide it. Then you, they want to sell it to sell you. Sell it to you, know. you later, yeah. Right, yeah. But <laughs> I, I, got, I got smart on that. We managed so, to get uh, dickbeyondefilm.com, so. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah Dick, I'm, and I watched that film uh, with all the different people. You know, the one that you showed about the, uh, which was on, on I, a couple oh, of weeks for back. Dick's birthday. About a month. Yeah, on Dick's birthday, right? Oh, great! And that was that was that was really interesting to watch that. Yeah. Oh, thank you. All the you. people that 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 he helped and that. that and thank that you for being for part of it. And, yeah, thank you very much for doing yeah. that. That was awesome. That was great. Thank you. Well, this but, has been so fun talking to you, Brian. I just have enjoyed this so much. Thank you. Thank um, you, Pam. Yeah. All right. Keep yeah. us Thanks, keep us in oh, touch. Oh, thank you, Brian. Appreciate it, my friend. And. All uh, right. I will. Yeah, uh, stay in touch. And uh, Brian, thanks again. It was r- really an absolute uh, blast to uh, to meet with you and talk with you about your 
uh, fantastic career. And uh, thank you so much for, for joining us. And um, mm -hmm. before I depart, uh, just want to tell everybody again, uh, brianhyland.com. He's also on Facebook. Uh, also, uh, check out dickbeyondyfilm.com. Uh, also, our Facebook group and our Facebook page, our YouTube channel. Um, you're surrounded out there by Dick Behind You Film everywhere. You can't <laughs> miss us. Uh, we're always updating uh, about the film and projects and uh, the rock and roll show. So we're, we're always involved. And uh, we want to thank everybody out there for uh, their uh, support, Brian included. And uh, take care, everybody. Uh, it's my time to- Joe, oh, Joe, I just, I just had yeah. one other, I just thought you know, as you were yeah. speaking, that I, I left out something, and which is that I have a new uh, oh, a song okay. that was released and it's on Apple, Apple Music and Spotify. And uh, it, it's, uh, it's called You Got a Message. And it, it's been out for about maybe two or three weeks. Okay. So you can check, check that out too. Okay, that sounds Thank terrific. You. We definitely will. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And uh, all, right. Take, all right. Take care, everybody. Thanks, and, Joe. Uh, thanks, Pam. And everybody out there, be safe. Wear your mask. We want, you. we want you to join us next week. And again, Brian, thank you so much. Bye, thank everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Yeah.